Um, so my talk is called Post-Functional. It's a, a, a purposefully um, controversial sounding. Um, it's not as bad as it sounds. Uh, so I want this talk to sort of explore, I mean, I think uh, there's been a lot of uh, enthusiasm and excitement um, here about functional programming of all sorts, both uh, dynamic type, dynamically typed functional programming languages like Clojure and Haskell as well as um, typed ones like Haskell and Scala. So um, this talk is sort of inspired by um, three, three talks I became familiar with uh, in the past year. One's called um, Extracting Energy from the Turing Tur Tar Pit. Uh, sorry for the typo. Uh, that Alan gave at the Turing Centenary. And there's an amazing slide in this talk where he actually says, has, um, um, talks about what languages and how languages. And he says it's, 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 it's now time to really seriously think about how we might design um, uh, generic what languages. I mean, uh, functional programming is declarative, but I think we could do better. And he says, um, we, know, we now know about many ways to do uh, very sophisticated types of, of constraint solving and search and all this stuff. And it would be really great if we had a generic what languages that were powered by these how languages that can do um, a lot more work for us uh, um, so that we can write simpler programs. So what's, not how's. Um, another talk that, that is totally in this, this vein is uh, a really great talk that Gerald Sussman gave at Strange Loop 2011 uh, called We Really Don't Know How to Compute. And it's a great talk because the talk points out that not that much has happened since the 70s. I mean, um, we have more features, our languages are more expressive, our, our type systems are better, but in the end, we're still kind of doing the same thing, and uh, software is still complex. Um, and I think that's true. So, Alan Kay's talk is, is, is nice, but maybe it sounds a bit hand-wavy. Gerald Sussman's talk is nice, but maybe it's a bit hand-wavy. But here's a really concrete example from Guy Steele, this talk, Organizing Functional Code for Parallel Execution. And the subtitle is what's important, which is Fold L and Fold R considered, considered slightly harmful. And this talk, uh, 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 Rich Hickey actually pointed out a great insight about this talk, is that it's actually sort of a critique of, the, of functional programming uh, completely, because Functional programming comes from recursion theory and, and this notion of, of induction, right, in proof, right? But that's sort of a sequential thing. And so, so as, uh, as functional programmers, we often work with sequences, but we often talk about, well, we want to go from the sequence on the, on the left, or we want to go from the right. And that actually uh, uh, removes a lot of opportuni opportunities for things like parallelism and concurrency. That could happen automatically if we were uh, less specific, if we said more things about what we want to do and less things about how we want to do it. Um, so I think the language that I think um, uh, peop, uh, a group of programmers that have, um, have a, I think, a, a little bit better notion of what, uh, if you learn about Prolog, there's a lot of how involved in Prolog. But in general, Prolog tries to strive for what. And specifically, there is a pure fragment of Prolog, which is really amazing. When you read pure Prolog, it's really great because you, you really feel like you're reading something completely declarative. It actually shouldn't matter. Uh, at all what order the clauses get evaluated. And so there's something deeply concurrent um, about Prolog. And in fact, it inspired uh, an incredible amount of research in and parallelism or parallelism. Um, and I don't, think it's, um, uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that one of the great uh, uh, concurrent programming languages sort of came out of Prolog. Uh, hopefully you got to see um, uh, the great keynote this morning by the inventors of Prolog, uh, uh, Robert Verding, and Joe Armstrong. Um, it, I mean, it was really great for them to talk about how they, how they kept moving, but I, I really think that there was just a lot of ideas in Prolog that influenced the design of Erlang. Um, something you also see is that smart programmers like smart things like Prolog, so, so every, the people keep trying to like, you know, Haskell's cool, but wouldn't it be cool if we had some of the semantics uh, of Prolog inside of Haskell? This is a great paper and has actually laid the foundation for um, uh, what I work on, this, this project called CoreLogic, which is implementation of, of Mini Cameron for Clojure. So this is a really great book by Dan Friedman, who worked on this um, excellent book called Little Schemer, William Byrd, and Oleg Kislyov, who is a very familiar name if you like Haskell. So Mini Cameron is a 200 lines of scheme, which is pretty incredible, because if you actually go through this book and you've never done any prolog, it really sort of messes with your head. And then at the end, you like read the implementation, it's on two pages, and you're like, that, that can't really be the case. Um, if you got to see Phil Wadler's excellent talk on, um, on, on, uh, on, on a little bit where he talked about Proust and Curry and Church, uh, he really, at the end, he talks about how important it is 
to have extremely simple models. And that's the beauty of mini camera, right? It, it, it follows the same principle, right? It, so I, I almost felt like Phil, Wall, Phil Waller was trying to say, you know, if you can't put the model on half a page, it's no good. And Dan Friedman is famous for saying uh, there was never an interesting piece of code that took up more than half a page. So uh, mini camera is nice. It's, it's a purely functional monadic design. Um, and what's cool about that, and I'm not going to talk about monads, so don't get scared. Um, but uh, uh, if you have a purely functional design, you, you basically get backtracking for, for free. And this is kind of neat in the way that this works. Uh, something else that was nice, that was nice timing is that um, Will and Dan both are at Indiana University where Kent Dib, uh, Dibvig went, um, who is a uh, sort of compiler hacker master, and he works on this thing called Sheet Chase Scheme. And what was uh, interesting was when they compiled Mini Canrin, as well as Canrin, uh, an, a prior version, is they saw that they were able to get um, basically sweet, uh, sweet prolog level performance. And Sweet Prolog is written in C and it's been worked on for 20 years. Uh, granted, Sweet Prolog is not the fastest uh, prolog you can find, but still it's very exciting that uh, Sweet Prolog is used to do very serious work and they were able to embed a, a good fragment of Prolog in Scheme and get decent performance. Um, the other thing about, uh, uh, if it was just Prolog, it wouldn't be that exciting, but Mini Cameron is a lightweight embedding within Scheme. So I mean, hopefully you're gonna see this, um, we can sort of, uh, not get rid of our functional programming fun and do some relational stuff at the same time. So CoreLogic takes Mini Cameron. It emphasizes efficiency. There are many design decisions that I changed in Mini Cameron for, to make it faster. The, the, but the big thing that, that CoreLogic does is it really emphasizes polymorphism, which is a big idea in, in, in Clojure. Um, so all critical parts of the system should, be, should allow for open extension. Um, and you'll see this. Uh, includes unification, uh, constraints, what solvers you, you might want to use, uh, what search strategies you might want to use. So this should all be configurable and tweakable. At the same time, we don't want this, the surface a part of the language, the, the nice beautiful core that is Mini Cameron, to be any more complex than, than the original design. So can we have the same nice surface syntax, but then can, can somebody uh, modify a couple protocols and get a uh, uh, slightly different system? So the core language, so this was like my spiel. So I'm not gonna, now it's gonna be a bunch of live coding. Uh, if something's confusing, raise your hand, ask me questions, uh, what have you. So, uh, I'm going to have a bunch of examples. I'll show the prologue uh, at the top, and then I'll show the equivalent um, uh, core logic code. So, uh, core logic code, again, you'll see, if you know monadic stuff, you'll see syntax that looks very monadic. But basically, when you write a relational program in core logic, you start with run star, you sort of provide the output logic variable in brackets, and then you have a series of goals which you want to satisfy. So I say, tell me the value of Q uh, such that it's equal with true, and this is trivial, right? And I, and I get a list of results because like, like a SQL query, you might have multiple possibilities. So it says the only value for Q that satisfies this statement, uh, Q is equal to true, is if Q is true itself. Um, it doesn't matter what order, right? What order you, you, you pass your, your, what I'll call terms, to this double equals operator, which is not the closure double equals operator. This is, uh, it stands for unification. So it's the operator which says we want to make these two terms equal. So here's one where I say, tell me for what values of Q um, would Q equal false? Q has to be false. So in Prolog, if you want to do what's called a logical conjunction, conjunction where you want to satisfy multiple goals, you want to say and basically, um, you use the comma. Uh, in CoreLogic and Mini Cameron, the body uh, of a run star, it's implicitly conjuncted. So here I say, for what values of Q is Q equal to true and Q equal to false? Of course, that's a contradiction, right? There are no, there are no answers for that. There are no, there are no values for Q that can satisfy that. Um, if you know about... Um, Logic variables are kind of interesting because you can also think about it as uh, we can assign to them one time. We can give it a value once, and if we ever use the unification operator again, that value better be the same. So if I do this, that's okay, right? So uh, I'm gonna introduce another operator 
which is in order to do interesting work, you want to be able to often create what are called fresh logic fars. So fresh is analogous to schemes let or let in Haskell or OCaml or standard ML. Um, it creates a lexical scope. It creates a logic variable so you can do more work. So here I say, you know, unify Q with X and then unify X with one. So Q has to be one there, right? So this one's interesting. I, I create two fresh logic variables. I make a closure vector, which is like an array type, and I unify that with Q, and I get this weird underscore zero, underscore one character. So this just tells me um, that I have a result in which um, those fresh vars were never ground. They were never assigned values. Uh, we can see this in action here. Um, uh, well, actually, I'll, something I'll, I'll show you in a second, but. This one says, uh, now unification is, only, is not that fun on simple values like true and numbers. It gets more interesting when you have complex terms. And, by, and when I say terms again, I just mean closure data structures. Uh, so here I have a vector with x, x and 2 in it and a vector with 1 and y. So what values for x and y can make those two complex terms equal? Well, 1 and 2, right? The vector 1 and 2 is equal to the vector 1 and 2. And you can sort of start seeing like, oh, this is kind of crazy. It's figuring out all this stuff for you. You can actually solve some interesting problems once you have this ability. But if this was all we were getting, it wouldn't be that exciting. So here I'm showing you that we can combine um, functional programming and logic programming in the same program. So this is, this is let. This is let inside of the body of a run. I make a local binding where I added two numbers together. I'm able to unify that with, with Q. It just works. Right? So, so if it was just prolog, it'd be like, ah, you just did prolog. Who cares? But this, isn't, this is not just prolog. Right? We have full access to functional programming uh, while we're doing relational programming. Yes? What's up with that stretch table without So it's just creating a, it's just creating a scope. Um, you have to remember that the body of a let uh, won't work the right because in, you need to have at least have, you need to use one of the primitive forms for things to work correctly. So fresh is, sorry, I didn't say that. Fresh is like run star. You can have multiple goals in the body of a fresh and they're also conjunctive. This is, this is just because um, run star doesn't know anything about lets. So I use the let to create a scope to do some functional work, and then I have to have another scope that understands the magical world of, of run star. So this is something that I don't show very much, and it's hard to get out of the books, uh, both the William Byrd's dissertation on Mini Cameron or the Reason Schemer. So if you know about monads, this will make perfect sense, or if you've ever done a Lisp interpreter, this will make some sense. So here I have run star, and I've made an anonymous function which takes some strange magic parameter called A, I print it, and then I return it. So you see that, oh, there's this value, this, there's this value being threaded. And in fact, this whole notion of, of, of goals, are, they're just function closures, they're just functions. So when I say unify a logic far plus something else, that's actually gonna close over those arguments and return a function which takes this map and does something to it. Well, what does it do to it? So this, we're going to unify x with 1, y with 2, unify q with uh, a vector that has x and y in it. We'll print it out, and we're going to return that. And so, bam, right? The substitution map is a hash map which maps logic vars to whatever you said the unification was going to be, right? So q is bound to a vector with two logic vars, y is bound to, a vect uh, bound to 2, and x is to 1. So all that happens in, 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 in core logic and mini Cameron is you have a bunch of closures, and we thread the substitution map through the system so that you can do these sort of cool logic programming things, which I'll show some more of. So uh, it's not fun if you can just do conjunction. In prolog, you have the semicolon operators to represent logical disjunction, or. So here I have uh, some code which says uh, Q is either equal to T or coffee. And so this is the first time we've seen multiple possibilities, multiple answers. So this says, yes, uh, the first possibility is tea, the next possibility is coffee. Um, sometimes it's important to only get uh, as many answers as you really care about. So you can change from run star to run n. So I can say run one and get just one thing out of it. So if you know prolog, you know prolog has a, a very specific strategy called depth first. Um, so I'm going to show that Mini Cameron has a neat little trick. So this is a goal, right? Goals, again, are just functions. So I've made a regular closure function here. 
but the body is something that, that, um, that the system is to understand, which is a fresh. And then notice I recursively call the thing itself. So this is a goal that clearly never terminates. We're never going to get anything out of, this, out of this goal. So here I have, I, have, I have this, and you should be worried, right? So we know that, that condies sort of try every possibility. They're going to try each clause. Kind of, it's, they're like fresh's con, uh, sorry, like schemes con or closures con. Only one clause is going to succeed. But we know in log the logic programming world, this is or. It's going to try every one. So there's a bad one there on the first one, on that first line, right? There's something that we know will produce no answers. And then my computer has locked up. I'm going to kill that. So that kind of stinks. But what's cool about, about Mini Camera is Mini Camera does this di diagon diagonalization thing. It doesn't actually do prologue step first. It kind of does this really cool uh, um, trampoline thing where it flips between branches. So here I can say run one and still get an answer. And this is pretty neat. You can't do this in prologue, right? So if there is a possibility in other branch, the infinite branch can't steal time. This is, so this is fair, called fair disjunction. So we have that, that's it. Those are all the operators. That's the entire language. Run, you've got unification, you've got condi, you've got fresh. There are, that's it. If you read the reason schema, you won't encounter anything else besides that. Um, and you can do a lot with that. But let's see. Okay, if you know functional programming, you know what this means. Cons, right? You want to add something to a list. Okay, cool. We know about this. So what would it mean? What would it mean if, if we had a relational version, a sort of a more logical version of cons? And so we have, so CoreLogic and Minicamera provides this thing called cons O. So instead of a function which takes inputs and outputs, we've got something where the, the whole notion of inputs and outputs are quite different. And this should make sense because we saw that goals, what do goals do? Goals only take substitution maps and return substitution maps. So the whole notion of parameters doesn't even really make sense. So here I have cons. I want to, uh, the relation of the relational version of cons. What is the value of Q that satisfies the cons relationship? Right? If I cons A on to BC, right? Sure. That's not that interesting. This is, this is, this is starting to get interesting because we're saying, what is the value of Q such that if we had BC and we know we're going to get ABC, what value of, of Q could satisfy that? So Q would have to have be the symbol A. Same here. For what value of Q could we cons A onto Q such that we would get ABC? Well, the only possibility is if Q was BC. Now this one, this is, this is a contradiction. There is no possible value for Q such that you could cons B onto Q and get ABC. It's not possible. No answers. And this one is even more interesting, right? So here I've said a fresh var, I've cons it onto this thing, and now I actually have a representation for all lists, right, that, that, are, that have three elements that end in BC. So I could do this, right? Unify Q to ABC. Oops, what happened there? Sorry. That works. This works. Right? But this should not work. So only, only lists with the right structure will work. Cool. So if you do a lot of mini camera, you eventually get annoyed because Prolog is pretty, pretty awesome because Prolog was designed to do this stuff, whereas mini camera is sort of like a schemey, a whole, very, it's very schemey. And uh, eventually I realized that you really want Prolog level of expressiveness. And so I went ahead and added um, enough sugar such that you, we could do much more prolog style programming. In particular, prolog is very powerful. Uh, 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 I mean, it's more general than pattern matching. So it's very powerful to do things like that line says, um, basically pull apart the first argument and then just unify uh, the values of the head and the tail of the thing in the first argument into a, a list in the second argument. And that's very succinct. But we can do the same thing because I went ahead and added um, pattern ma this sort of like pattern matching prolog like sugar to closure because this is Lisp and we can do that. 
So, right? So that's the sugar. Um, we're able to pull apart those things and get a new value for Q, which uh, is exactly what that pattern match sort of thing looked like. Okay. So if you saw my talk yesterday, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to repeat something. All this stuff, uh, or not all of this, uh, the first half of this talk actually works in JavaScript now because of ClojureScript, and I've ported CoreLogic to ClojureScript, uh, the, the first portion of this talk anyway. So there's a famous puzzle called the Zebra Puzzle or Einstein's Puzzle. It appeared December 17th, 1962 in this edition of Time Magazine, and it goes something like this. Who owns a zebra? A series of statements. There are five houses, Englishman lives in the red house, Spaniard owns the dog, uh, coffee is drunk in the greenhouse, and so on. It ends with who, own, who drinks water and who owns the zebra. And basically, there are five houses. They have five properties. Nationality of the person, what type of uh, drink do they like, what do they smoke, what type of animal do they own, and what color is their house. So in this really fantastic book called The Paradigms of Artificial Intelligence Programming uh, in Common Lisp, Peter Norvig shows you how to build an interpreted prologue. He shows you how to do a compiled prologue. And he points out that this problem has, if you did the naive, brute force, it, uh, sort of enumeration of all possibilities, 24 billion candidate solutions. Uh, uh, there's actually a famous person called James, uh, is it James Robinson? J.L.? J.A. J. Robinson, who in the 60s pointed out the resolution principle and said, oh, we can make searches much faster because of this idea of unification. So, so by building the prologue, like, Unification can basically eliminate all those parts of the search tree that don't satisfy the solution. Um, so in 1993, when he wrote this version in Common Lisp, he could solve this puzzle in uh, 17 seconds. And we'll see how fast we can solve it. So before we do this, um, I want to break down some of the, 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 the goals. So this, one, this is expresses, can we find if y is to the right of l so the, why is the right of x and l? And the pattern matching sugar is kind of fun because what are we looking at in the first possibility? Well, we found x and y at the head in the beginning of l. The second possibility is that we didn't find it. We have to keep going. So is the cat to the right of the dog? It is not. Is the dog to the right of the cat? It is. Is the dog to the, uh, is the, is the dog, sorry, is the cat, sorry, is the cat right, to, right of the dog? In this case, the cat's on to the left, but he's not to the right, or she. Um, so we can do this by uh, making a new goal called next O, which is awesome, right? This is, this is very declarative. I have the right one, so I can just simply flip the things. I can say, um, is Y to the right of X, or is X to the right of Y? And now I have a relation that can look for things being next to each other. And that previous goal works now, because this one will check for both cases. So now we have this really nice way of literally translating the sentences, right? This first line says there are five houses, because each underscore represents a house. And then in this middle one, somebody drinks milk. In the first house is the Norwegian. Next to the Nor Norwegian is the blue house. To the right of the ivory house is the green house. The Englishman lives in the red house, and so on. OK, so what's the answer? Bam. Um, the Norwegian drinks uh, water because the water is the middle property, and the Japanese man owns um, the zebra. That seemed to be pretty fast. So how is it? How fast is it? So we're doing it 1,000 times. So we can solve that, pu that, that puzzle in 2.5 uh, milliseconds versus 17 seconds in 1993. So that's pretty cool. You have to start thinking, maybe, maybe there are lots of problems that we could solve uh, now that we have ridiculously fast supercomputers uh, at, you know, as, as machines. I think uh, people gave this stuff up too early because we hadn't really reached that point where something like this actually runs in a reasonable amount of time. Um, so I would like to talk about that more, but I've got a bunch of other stuff that I want to show. So one thing is that Mini Cameron only does unification on lists, and that is not that fun because in Clojure, we have lot, uh, much cooler data structures than lists. So here, I've added um, unification for maps. So that's pretty cool, right? I can unify these two data, the Clojure data structures and run queries on them just like I would. And this is completely open, and I'll, and I'll demonstrate that. 
So if you have some data structure, whether you write in Java or Clojure, you can make unification work for your data structure. So that will fail because the, the map on the right has too many keys. So say you have some type foo and you want to, you want to make um, CoreLogic understand your, your, your type, your new term. So you come up with a protocol and say, protocol and say I want to be able to unify foos. We def whoops, we defined that. And, and then you define your type foo and you have, to, you have to implement a couple things. First of all, we say you have to implement unified terms because this will happen when the first time we try to unify your thing. And then you say, well, I know I'm a foo and tell the other term to unify with me. Uh, in the case that we have a foo and we're unifying with foo, what do we do? We say, well, there's nothing to do. That worked. We're just going to return the substitution map uh, unchanged. If unification fails, you return nil. Right. And we've got to handle some other cases. Uh, we never unify with nil, and we don't unify with objects which are not foos. So does foo unify with one? No, because object is actually not, you're not, it's just saying the default case when we say object, we don't unify with Java objects that are not foos. Um, sadly, foo doesn't even, uh, does not unify with tech mesh rocks, which it does. But it does unify with foos, right? That works. Um, and this might seem like a toy, but something that somebody recently added that's really useful I did not work on this. Somebody else submitted this, and they didn't have to change core logic at all. They just have to just add this functionality very cleanly uh, via the unification protocols. So they realize that, oh, sometimes I don't care whether the full map unifies. I just want to test for the presence of certain key value pairs. So this is going to succeed, even though the maps are not equal, because we only care whether foo, the, the pair foo bar exists, the key value pair exists. That works. But this one does not because the other map doesn't have the, the foo bar key value pair. And that's pretty nice. And so this was requested because people want to do some pretty interesting stuff with configuring, uh, with configuration. So moving into the last part of the talk where we'll really see functional programming and the sort of constraints um, and logic programming come together. Um, so prolog has, has another problem, right? So this doesn't work. This is not valid prolog. Right? You can't say uh, x, unify x with 1, unify y with 2, z equal x plus y. It just doesn't work because x and y aren't, aren't actually numbers. Right? They're logic bars. You actually can't add them. Um, this will blow up in prolog. This blow, I'm not going to run this. This blows up in, um, in uh, core logic. In prolog, you have to say is. You have to say z is x plus y. And this kind of sucks because Everything that I've shown so far seems like, oh, well, I can put clause, I can do these goals first and these goals later, um, and it's really great. This seems really awesome. You don't have to think about order. But with is, you have a not, what's called a non-relational operation, and suddenly order, or the order that you declare your clauses becomes extremely important. So we have a similar functionality to do this in CoreLogic called project, where it creates uh, a local scope where uh, those x and y are bound to their actual values, so you can do what you want. Um, however, right, what if you project too early, right? If we project too early before we unify them with values, it's still going to blow up. And suddenly you're like, oh, prolog sucks. You can't, you can't actually do anything with it. I mean, the stuff in the beginning seemed, oh, like there was a promise of something cool, but it seems um, sort of dashed on the rocks now. But we've learned things. Constraints. So uh, the prolog community figured this out in the uh, late 80s, or mid late 80s, and they realized they needed a richer uh, uh, f uh, language for constraints. And so prolog three actually had quite a few. You had what's called constraint logic programming. You had constraint logic programming over reals and uh, integers and so on. Um, and that and they were able to do it, and it was very slow. And so it took many, many, many more years of research before people figured out how to do it efficiently. And even when they knew how to do it efficiently, there were still more problems to solve. This is an incredible book. I thoroughly recommend it, Concepts and Techniques and Models of Computer Programming. Um, it's about this language called Mozart Oz. Um, and and there's, it's a great primer uh, into um, constraint logic programming and why that's useful. Um, so we're going to show some of the things you can do uh, before I show the next slide. Actually, well, we're going to talk about Sudoku. but. 
I'm going to show this first. Okay, so what does this do? So this is fun. So we're now able to get back to where we wanted to be. This was implemented in the past. It took me about a year to get this right, but <laughs> but I finally did. Um, so here we can now work with numbers in a sensible way, and we don't need projection. So we can say x and y belong to the domain of integers between 0 and 9, and we're able to write our equations in list syntax. And here we say, discover, we want to know the value for x and y such that if we add x and y together, we get 9. If we multiply x by 2 and we add it to y times 4, that we get 24. Right? That's, that's pretty cool. And somebody figured out that I had this and it added it, and they're already doing um, virtual machine uh, configuration using uh, inequalities with this stuff. Okay, so let's do the, f uh, the best part of this example. So we're going to do Sudoku. So here's our data. And this the f everything I'm going to show you is just functional programming. We've, we've not going to do any logic programming here. So here, we want to be able to take our Sudoku hints and initial values and extract the rows. So it's 81 possible values for the Sudoku game. We want to be able to convert it into the rows. We also want to convert into the columns. There's our columns. We need some way to get the squares, right? So this is just functional programming. There's no logic programming going on here. This is a list comprehension like you would have a list comprehension in, in Haskell. So this one can extract a square, so like a Sudoku square. Um, we want to calculate all the squares. So there is all the squares. So now we can get the rows, we can get the columns, we can get the squares. Um, and that's because we want to apply constraints, because that's what all Sudoku is. Sudoku has to be unique rows, unique columns, unique squares. So this is where it gets a little bit nuts, right? This is the function to take 81 logic bars, which represent the board, and to initialize them to the hints. So what do we do? This is, we're going to use, we're going to construct the goal that can initialize them. Um, so if the vars are empty, we're done. We, we, we pass the successful goal. Uh, if not, we get the first hint. And we say, if the first hint is 0, go ahead and unify it, uh, is not 0, unify it with that initial value. Otherwise, keep going. So this is pretty, pretty cool. We're actually using Clojure's functional programming to construct the relation which can initialize the logic vars. Bam. And this is where it gets, uh, where it all pays off, right? So we construct 81 logic vars, we calculate the rows, the columns, the squares, and then here we say all the vars are in the domain of, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We initialize the hints with that really cool functional programming plus relational programming thing. We say all the rows are distinct, all the columns are distinct, all the squares are distinct. That's exact, that's Sudoku. There is nothing else to it. Some pretty printing. So <clears throat> that seems to be right. We can sort of glance over the result, and it looks right. But how do we really know it's right? So I made a very simple function to verify it. And what does this do? All it does is it reuses some of the functions. And what we do is we collect the rows, the columns, and the squares, and we put the values into a set. And every set better have nine elements in it, right? That's how we verify how we verify this. Okay. So did we actually solve it? We did. That's pretty nice. Then you better then we wonder, well, that's cool, but I've seen lots of Sudoku solvers, and most of them are some of them are fast, some of them are slow. How fast is this one? Well, that's not bad, 18 milliseconds, right? That's pretty good. This is an extremely generic way to solve Sudoku, right? I didn't do any special casing here, right? This is a generic language for in which, in using the generic language, I solved a very specific problem. I think it'd actually be twice as fast. I have, I've, in the past, I had versions that could solve this in six milliseconds, but I, th there's more work to do to get back to that. So I've got a little bit more time. Um, so one thing I want to show is that the, the entire system is extensible. You can actually provide new constraint solvers. You want to do CLP set, go ahead. You want to do CLPR, go ahead. 
Uh, I might not implement it, but the infrastructure is there for implement it, to implement it if you want to. So here I have a little uh, thing called uh, def c, which can take any arbitrary closure predicate or sort of Boolean statement in regular closure, and it will construct a, a proper constraint for you. So here I say run star number c, and this is pretty cool, right? It says any value as long as it satisfies the number c constraint. Um, and that just works with this, right? That should work because, yes, we say x is a number, and when we unify it with that other lit, uh, vector, that's a number that works out. But if we do this, right, that fails. And people have been asking for this for a long time, and we have that now. OK, so what's this good for? Um, people ask me that a lot. So complex configuration is something that's um, taken off in the closure community. I know Lono Cloud, I think, uses it for this. Palette um, uh, uses it for this, I think, now. Uh, there's a guy called Kevin Lina uh, who works on this thing called C2, which is a sort of R-like um, statistical graphics visualization library. And uh, it sort of competes with ggplot, but the problem with ggplot is that you often have to specify too much, even though there's lots of things that could be inferred. So he actually wants to use CoreLogic to do inference on so that you don't have to do the entire configuration for the statistical graphic. It can infer properties from a very simple data description. Uh, it's used for static analysis. There's a group, I want to say in the Netherlands, um, they used to work on this project called Sol, which was taking um, uh, Prolog and Smalltalk and doing some pretty cool um, static analysis. They've taken CoreLogic, they've created a plugin for Eclipse that can use queries that are written in CoreLogic to query the, um, the AST, the, the Java AST. There's a pretty nice, tiny project called Kabit, which is a linter, um, which really only uses the unification part to do pattern matching, but people really like it. Um, uh, mini camera work is continuing to go on. Um, uh, Indian University uh, worked on some pretty cool declarative GPU programming uh, with mini camera, uh, which could probably be ported to uh, uh, CoreLogic. And then the, this is something that I really would like to see. Uh, I think this requires me to do CLP set which actually is pretty easy compared to the finite domain stuff that I showed. Um, we have typed closure or, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a work in progress, but it's pretty far along. But one thing type closure do doesn't do that's pretty nice from languages that have uh, static types like Haskell or standard ML is that you have really good inference. So typed closure, because it's based on type bracket, which doesn't have inference, they just haven't uh, uh, tackled that problem. But I believe that we might be able to uh, support that with something like uh, the constraint stuff that I showed. So just an ending comment, so culture, so um, OOP, FP, and LP, it's all old stuff. This is not new stuff. Um, uh, for whatever reason, we have a mainstream culture on OOP. Uh, it's pretty exciting uh, to be here, and in also places like Strangely, where you see that functional programming is gaining more and more traction. Um, and I hope that, you know, we, we're hoping that from functional programming, you're writing simpler programs. Um, uh, LP is, I think, still at the fringes. Uh, people are often surprised when I bring it up. People think, oh, isn't Prolog dead or is just Prolog? And I hope I've shown that like, logic reprogramming has kept going. It's not, it's not going to stop. People are, are going to do more and more interesting things with it, and it's a pretty wide field. Um, and I'm very interested in uh, uh, two things. One is that I think functional programming is a pretty awesome how language. Like, it's okay. Functional programming is great at how. Uh, but perhaps functional programming is a really good way to build uh, some of this what, right? That we, maybe we can uh, construct higher level languages off of functional programming. Uh, that's it. Questions? Is there time for questions? Yes. Other questions? No questions? Oh. So, uh, have you tried parallelizing this? So, uh, I have not tried it, but somebody else has tried it. So, um, there's a really, uh, the reason I started on this is, is there's, a, there's a man in the uh, closure community called Jim Dewey, and I remember reading his blog post, and I saw the zebra puzzle, and I was like, I have to understand how that works. That makes no sense. How could that work? Um, and he actually uh, had implemented it, and I, and re-implemented it and made it a little bit more efficient and I generalized it. But he came back and, and worked on my thing again 
And he saw that if you, if you switch to what's called the continuation monad, right, the, the inside the engine, if you switch the sort of monadic structure to use the continuation monad, you can actually use um, JDK7 fork join, and, and you're, you can run these in parallel. There is the open problem of, of granularity, right? It's like, at which point should, should, we, should the search fork? Um, and we need to work on that. But um, it was promising because the version that he did doesn't run any slower. That's pretty big. That, it, that's, that's actually a concern. Like, usually when you do this, it just runs slower. Right? That's a problem with, with uh, trying to parallelize these things. I mean, not, not really. So it just, the way fair disjunction works is that um, it's just a trampoline. That's really how mini camera works because it's not an eager system. It's actually lazy, so it, com it sort of computes the stream as you pull things off of it. And so what happens is that you have all these thunks that are unrealized, and if you have branches, you sort of have thunks, and what we do is we just, we just jump back and forth between thunks as we force them. Um, it's a really cool trick. Um, I could explain it more in detail later. Oh yeah, so um, that's a good question. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff that, I mean, it's gotten to the point where, it, so CoreLogic, so MiniCameron is small. It's 200 lines of code. CoreLogic is actually now quite big. It's 4,000 lines of code. Um, and it's probably going to get bigger. Um, a lot of that's because solvers, doing efficient solvers is quite hard. Uh, and the solver that we have is pretty good, as you, as you saw, but it could be considerably faster. And there's a lot of literature on how to make it faster. So one would be making finite domains faster. It would be nice if we were pretty good. And it would also be an interesting comparison with, there are a lot of constraint solvers out there, and people put a lot of work into backtracking, right? Because they're, they're mutating state. So they have, to, they have to trail all the changes, and it kind of sucks. Whereas here, I, I don't have to do anything. This is all persistent data structures. If, if something fails, bam, it's gone. We go back to the old, the old values, and I don't have to, I don't have to do anything there. Um, so it would be an inter very interesting to compare once we have something that we think is as fast as we can get. How does this compare to solvers that use mutation? So that's, that's one thing I'm interested in. Um, there are other things. Tabling is big. If you, if you are know anything about logic programming, if you have really good tabling, um, there's a lot of power. Um, then uh, I think... I mean, there's a bunch of other stuff. I mean, we can look at negation. Um, and definitely, I'm excited about doing something in parallel. That would, that would be big. 